So CBD is going to pay more attention to have residents got the skills and how can we use simulation to help them achieve those skills, especially where real life doesn't provide the opportunities that they need. Simulation is going to have a huge role in CBME because if you're asking a junior resident to achieve a certain level of competence before they go to the next level, I think a lot of the assessment that takes place um, around those competencies is going to take place at the simulation center, not on a real patient, but in an observed setting, either in a theater-based simulation with mannequins or with technical skills uh, with surgical simulation or during a standardized patient encounter. I think we're going to take a lot of that learning curve out of the hospital and bring it to the simulation center. Procedure-based programs and surgical programs seem to have utilized that opportunity more. For early learners, um, simple uh, simulations in a, in a lab can be very effective. Definitely love simulation. It gives you a chance to practice soft skills that you don't think about on a day, daily basis. When you're working in the OR, if there's a crisis, you don't think about how you are able to communicate, how you're able to get stuff done to promote the best patient care possible. With simulation, you're placed into these unexpected crisis situations and you can reflect on how you react as a person. You also get insight into how you are as a leader, your styles, how you work with other people, how you communicate. And so once again, it just lets you reflect more on what you are like as a whole picture and how you can be a leader and be a team player as well. And we've seen some interprofessional simulation done here where we have anesthesia, nursing, and surgical units working together. And it gives the, the trainee the opportunity to be exposed to that situation where things are going perhaps less than ideal and learn how to communicate with each other. And so there is just a huge communication piece. It has nothing to do with the technical skills so much as to how do they communicate with each other, how do they think, and how do they collaborate to get through that problem. And that's something that a trainee in the OR would rarely be exposed to, or if they were exposed to, the staff person would usually be running that situation. So that's a perfect opportunity for simulation. Uh, simulation is this sexy thing in medical education, so a lot of people want to use it for everything. Um, but much like any resource, it needs to be allocated properly. With the growing uh, you know, interest in patient safety, those types of things, for the types of, of procedures and um, events that are rare, hopefully, um, but that have a high impact on patient safety, simulation is a great environment to do that. Um, trainees may not be exposed frequently to these types of situations, but they need to know how to manage that. So simulation is perfect. So some people are concerned about the price tag on simulation, and they're concerned that uh, they can't uh, come to the Sim Center, uh, they can't put on a high fidelity activity for their residents because it's too expensive. And I just want to say that we don't use the word fidelity anymore. It's not a high fidelity mannequin and we, and we know that you don't need a high fidelity mannequin to assess some of the intrinsic can meds roles. You can have an easy standardized patient encounter. You can teach a resident how to communicate uh, with a nurse, how to communicate with colleagues here at the simulation center in a very low budget way. You match your simulation to the learning objective. You don't need to buy a $100,000 simulator that's going to sit in a closet most of the year and not be used. You need to design a curriculum around your objectives and you can easily achieve a lot of the objectives with respect to the intrinsic can meds roles without an expensive simulator. For example, when we teach our residents about uh, bronchoscopy, we, we could teach them using the high fidelity simulation model, we could teach them using our bronchoscopy virtual reality simulator, or we could teach them using our homemade uh, bronch bronch uh, model, which is what we actually do. We don't use the expensive um, high fidelity, difficult to maintain equipment. Um, there were studies that showed that using a, a low cost uh, wooden model was just as uh, efficacious in the residents attaining the skill of being able to manipulate the bronchoscope and so that's what we use. So now what we have is a, a black box where we have 
um, wooden sheets with holes drilled through them that are labeled and uh, we ask the resident to go in with the bronchoscope and manipulate through a series of holes in different directions as, as we've directed them to do and they learn the, the manual skills of being able to manipulate the bronch uh, without having to use the more expensive models. In internal medicine we use simulation a lot for our procedures uh, with you know, diagnostic imaging taking over a lot of the procedures that we used to do at the bedside, trainees are less and less exposed to that. So we're using simulation to um, really ensure that people have the skills so that when they need to perform this on a real patient that we're confident that they're able to do that. And we're using simulation not only as a teaching tool but also as an assessment tool and I think that's important. We see a lot of programs who have all these simulation projects but there's never really um, an, an evaluation of, of what that was. So in medicine for example we have a procedural skills OSCE where we uh, assess our residents in PGY-1 and in PGY-3 to see if our curriculum actually had an impact. And that's going to be important um, because we're going to implement a lot of different changes with competency-based ed education. We need to assess those changes. Where our residents are doing hysteroscopies on melons, uh, they're doing, um, there's some cadaver workshops where they're, they're doing surgery on cadavers, uh, how to put in an IUD, we have a workshop about IUDs, we have workshops for pediatric and adolescent gynecology uh, with how to, how to uh, talk to a pediatric patient, how to examine a pediatric patient, all using simulation. We incorporate simulation into our uh, formative OSCE examinations where residents are uh, asked to do a uh, operative delivery on a model or are asked to demonstrate something on a model during our OSCEs. So our department has been uh, a very um, big user of the Simulation Centre over the years. Our role here, especially for the junior trainees, will only be increasing. Um, our goal is to get them as competent as possible, as early as possible, so that we're all comfortable and they are comfortable in the operating room participating in procedures. And the earlier we can get them uh, participating in those procedures, the more opportunities they will have, the better they will be and the more competent the trainee we will be graduating. We've uh, recently started a pilot program on um, uh, procedures, uh, skills training, um, and simulation. So this has the, uh, the potential to um, make more structured and uh, objective assessment of skills, as well as um, having uh, increasing the competence of residents who are graduating from the program in uh, image-guided procedures. Simulation gives us the opportunity to expose residents to both common and rare scenarios at any point in their training that we think it is necessary. So for example, in anesthesiology, something common that people may do is attend a code blue. When you're a very junior resident and you have not been to a code blue, I can tell you that you feel terrified deep in your heart. And so we can expose residents to code blue situations in the simulator and give them a chance to practice both the physical skills of you know, doing compressions or administering drugs and the team skills of helping to direct a code. But we also do things like role play and we do um, part test training uh, with uh, different uh, models that allow them to repeatedly and deliberately practice a skill. And at the OSCE we assess uh, how they're doing in a, in a number of different stations. And so that's something new that we started with the launch of our CBD program. We're going to be continuing to do that uh, over the course of the, the, the new cohorts coming in. We do an assessment of ACLS, ACLS or Advanced Cardiac Life Support Skills. Uh, we started that um, just a couple of years before we took, had our first intake of CBD residents and we're continuing to do that and that happens about part way through the residency where we're assessing their ability to um, properly conduct uh, a run a cardiac arrest. We have introduced uh, assessment at the senior resident level, uh, more at the late core or transition to practice level and this is via the Canadian National Anesthesiology Simulation Curriculum or CANASC scenarios. There's lots of support for uh, building simulation into your residency program. We have educational leads from every department. We get together and have uh, meetings every uh, month to discuss issues around curriculum, around uh, education within all the departments. And uh, if 
there's a faculty who wants to incorporate more simulation into their department, they can go to their own departmental educational lead or they can meet with me and I will have a consultation with them and try to brainstorm around how they can incorporate simulation into their program.